excited to see so many of you come out. Um, I was a little worried when Antifa was getting let out of the room that there wasn't going to be le anybody left in the room. They were taking up all the spaces. Um, so I'm so glad to see so many of you uh, with us tonight and I'm, I'm really looking forward to having a good conversation and dialogue with you. Hi, come in. We're just getting to the Q&A and I, anyone can line up and ask a question if they want. Um, just has to be a question, not a statement. Um, and if you're pro-choice, you get to cut in front of the line if you want. Sorry. Hi. So this is a question, but I am providing context ahead of time. Okay. According to the CDC, live birth has a higher mortality rate for women than abortion. You stated much earlier in the panel that you consider a woman who chooses an abortion a privileged, stronger person deciding yep. a fetus is inconvenient. Yep. Is that not implying that abortion is empowering women in that situation, and is it not lawmakers, especially sometimes male lawmakers, who are privileged to decide whether or not a woman will put her life at risk through forced birth or an unsafe abortion by outlawing abortion? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so one thing we have to know, and according to, I was looking for this amicus brief that was just filed at the Supreme Court not long ago, because when you talk about uh, maternal deaths, it's actually an apples to oranges comparison because it's actually, um, if a woman dies from having an abortion, it's actually not considered and it's not registered as a maternal death. Did you know that? Where is this coming from? These are from Supreme Court amicus briefs using the CDC's own, um, how, they, how they actually track mortality rates amongst pregnant women. Um, so it's actually an apples to oranges comparison. Maternal mortality is measured per childbirth, not pregnancy. So, that, so anytime a woman uh, has a natural miscarriage, she actually is not counted in that number. Um, it, it automatically excludes anyone who's had a natural miscarriage or stillbirth, except if a woman dies uh, and she's having a, she, has, she gives birth still and the child dies, stillbirth or miscarriage, those deaths are then included in the maternal mortality totals. Um, thus the relevant, here I'm reading this quote from this amicus brief, thus the relevant baseline population is artificially reduced by excluding cases of pregnancy loss, while the total of deaths still includes those maternal deaths resulting from the very same uncounted pregnancies. This combination inflates the reported percentage risk of childbirth in mathematical terms, the denominator of the risk fraction is reduced while the numerator of maternal deaths is maximized. The CDC itself has admitted that the statistics for maternal mortality and abortion mortality are conceptually different and used by the CDC for public, different public health purposes, which is like I said, apples to oranges. There's strong evidence that abortion is positively detrimental to maternal health and if anything, more likely lead to death uh, or other adverse consequences than continuing the pregnancy. I think, so I would say first, uh, until we have a national abortion reporting law, we actually can't have a very good educated conversation about maternal mortality in our country because we actually don't know. The numbers that the CDC gets about abortion, abortion complications are voluntary numbers. California and New York, the two largest abortion states, don't actually even report those numbers to the CDC. That's why earlier I'll even cite Guttmacher Institute's data because the Guttmacher Institute is a pro-abortion organization and sometimes they get the California data even though the CDC doesn't have the data. So I would say mortality, you can't really have, we can't have an educated conversation about apples to apples in our country because we lack a national abortion reporting law. I would also say though, for maternal mortality reasons, I brought it up about Planned Parenthood, if they're concerned, if we're concerned about caring for women, why are their prenatal services continuing to go down? Third point I would ask you is if there is a problem, and I believe there is a problem, especially in the African-American community, maternal mortality rates, and I think there's a whole range of public policy prescriptions we can debate on that, and we probably agree on some of those, why would we throw the baby out with the bathwater? I think it's an extremist position to say because black women, especially in our country, aren't seeking and not getting OBGYN care early enough in their pregnancy, which is leading to maternal mortality 
uh, rates, increase in those mortality rates, um, why would we say, therefore, she should, she should kill her baby? I think that's a very extreme position to take. I think the first question we should ask ourselves is what can we do to help her get to an OBGYN faster and earlier in the pregnancy? I think that's something that everyone can agree on. I believe you are sidestepping my actual question, which is okay. whether or not you are empowering lawmakers to have that decision versus a woman. Sure. I will answer that question too. Thank you. It's been a long day. Um, I would say that no one should have the right in our country to take the life of an innocent human being simply because they're inconvenient. And I think that's actually one of our fundamental, we can debate what the duties of government are. I mean, I know the Antifa protesters here, some of them are anarchists, so they don't believe we should have a government. Um, but one of the fundamental duties that most of us agree on is that the core principle of government is to protect the lives of citizens. Our founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence listed our natural rights in a specific order, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And when those rights get disordered, as they are in abortion, where a woman's liberty is put over a child's life, terrible things happen. And we can look throughout our human history and our collective American history to find many case studies, examples of that. So you're saying the government has the power to do this? I say the, the government has the power and should fundamentally, of all the things the government does, I think the government should have the power to prevent innocent people from being killed. Yes, absolutely. And, you and I don't think the gender of lawmakers, which you're assuming, by the way, I don't think the gender of lawmakers should determine whether or not the laws that are being passed are valid. Understood. So I'm saying this from what you're telling me, you're saying that lawmakers should have the ability to control whether or not a woman gets an abortion. I'm saying I believe abortion is a federal, state, and local issue. And one of the very fundamental duties of our government should be protecting the lives of innocent citizens and human beings. And the preborn child in the womb is absolutely a citizen. That child should be protected under our 14th Amendment. And we're currently working towards that in the pro-life movement. So absolutely, our lawmakers, whether they're men or women or whatever they identify as, they should be voting on laws that end killing of innocent human beings. Understood. Thank you. Next question? I, oh, sorry. I, I believe kids don't know accountability anymore. They don't know consequences. There are so many contraceptives out there before having sex. Why not take that preventative measure? Why, why not, you know, rather than become pregnant and then take the life of an unborn child? Also, there are these after morning after pills that I wonder how detrimental they are to, to the, the females. Like sure. the, the after they're, a drug of, they're a drug of choice of sex abusers across our country because any rapist uh, can walk into a CVS, Walgreens, or a campus vending machine, get a bunch of Plan B pills, and feed them unknowingly or force feed them to his, his victim, the woman he has raped or continues to rape, to cover up his crime. Uh, those are very dangerous. Yes. Uh, Plan B, Aftira, young kids mm -hmm. are coming into drugstores, and they don't even have to show an ID yeah, to get them. Right. They can be yeah. the under 18. We went 18. into several drugstores across the country when Plan B hit the market. Uh, Plan B, for your all situational awareness, is the hormonal birth control pill times 10 or times 11. So it's a very high dose pill. The original intention of Plan B is to stop an egg from being released from the ovary. So the intention of the pill is to be uh, birth control prevent the egg from being released, therefore the egg can't be fertilized because sperm can survive for several hours, not days. Um, sperm are those tricky little suckers. However, we also know, according to the back of the Plan B box, uh, it will say in, little, in the big font on the left side, will not harm existing pregnancy. But then you can go Google Images and trust me, you don't have to believe me. Uh, and then on the bottom of the right side in small, small font, it'll say, may prevent the implantation of a fertilized egg. Now, if you Google the word fertilized egg, you're like, what's a fertilized egg? Because once an egg is fertilized, is it an egg? It becomes a zygote. A unique genetic code comes into existence. A fertilized egg is one of those dehumanizing terms to make people feel like it's not an early abortion. So we do know Plan B could be abortifacient, and it's already on the back box. 
We do not know how likely it is because there's no studies on that. Because remember, we don't study these things in our country because we'd rather just shout at each other rather than having actual data. But we do know it could be abortifacient according to the back of the box. Um, and so it, it, is, it is problematic for pro-lifers. Um, and pro-lifers actually have varying opinions on Plan B because it's not an intentional an abortion but it could be an indirect abortion. So there's like a moral question that pro-lifers struggle with on there. But I would say Plan B is very scary. We went into several drugstores when Plan B hit the market with one of our team members who um, was in his mid forties with a 16 year old, well, she was a 15 year old girl uh, at the time and went up to the pharmacist. And this is when before it was like when it was just there behind the pharmacy counter. And we actually triggered the statutory rape reporting requirements in eight different states because we went up Eric asked for the Plan B pill. He asked for multiple Plan B pills, which is extremely dangerous for women. Made it known to the pharmacist, the pharmacist tech who was there, that he was having sex with a 15-year-old girl and they needed to cover their crime. And every single time, they were able to purchase the Plan B pills. And zero, zero reports of suspected sexual assault were actually filed, even though the pharmacy workers in every state we went into were considered mandated sexual assault reporters. So yes, it's very bad. And I just feel that the damage it does, yeah. when yeah. these young kids, if that's their only form of birth control, is sure. to take the, F, the Plan B or Aftira. It's not birth control. And they, and, they, and they say on the back box, do not use this as a regular method because they know it's harmful. And that. sometimes they'll get a pregnancy test and the Plan B. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but it's just I just worry about the damage done to yes. young kids since there's no ID yeah. required. Yes, kids. As I said, 14. it's a drug of choice for sex abusers. There's no law saying men and rapists cannot go get these drugs and continue to force feed them to his victims. Now with chemical abortion pills, you can actually with PlanC.org, you can be a man requesting chemical abortion pills from Mexico, get those pills and crush them upon women's tea. And there's actually several several cases before the courts of women actually finding out that their spouse, their partner, actually forced an abortion upon them. And depending on what state they live in, it may or may not be considered murder. So thank you for your question. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Next question. Um, hi. hi, so you said when you were talking to this person that um, unborn fetuses were citizens of the United States mm -hmm. and they should be treated as such. Well, in the, four, in the four, in clause one of the 14th Amendment, it says all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof mm -hmm. are citizens of the United States and the states where they reside. Mm -hmm. So a fetus isn't born yet, so mm -hmm. where are you getting this information that they're Yeah, in the 14th of? Amendment, it says that Congress can actually amend the 14th Amendment yeah. in terms of who is actually considered a, a citizen and a person. That's where we're getting that from, the public movement. Okay, There's like a whole legal paper we, we have, when, but that's the But simplest. where do you have information on like, or sources on where they've actually Well, you can go to, it. is it celebratelifeday.com? Yeah, nationalcelebratelifeday.com. We actually have a whole legal position paper uh, from our attorneys. I am not one. I just sometimes mm -hmm. act like one. Uh, but no, from our attorneys uh, talking about the 14th Amendment and where in the 14th Amendment actually says that Congress is, actually has the ability to change who the 14th Amendment specifically I understand to. that Congress has the ability to mm -hmm. change it. Yeah. I'm asking when they have done so. They, um, when they've done so, they haven't done so recently. Right. But have they ever made well, Yeah, it? women, right? Women are now. Okay, but have they ever... Women have Not always been children. citizens, but have they ever... Not to children. I'm asking, have they ever specifically Here, said have that unborn fetuses are United States citizens? No, they haven't. That's what we want them to do. You had just made that claim earlier. I was just trying yeah, to Yeah, they should clear that recognize up. them because we know human, these human beings are alive. We absolutely know they're alive and we know they're human beings. And mm -hmm. we actually, in several states right now, the pro-life movement's working to ensure that our laws actually become consistent with our pro-life beliefs like child support, for example. Child support should actually begin at conception. It should mm -hmm. not begin at birth. Um, tax benefits. Uh, so the state of Georgia, for example, is trying to enact this, where uh, your write-offs, I just did all my taxes, it was not fun. Uh, but if, you, uh, if you're pregnant, you know, right now, you can't write off your child, but the goal is, yeah, we should. In our tax code, we should be consistent in recognizing across all, all forms of our laws that the child in the womb uh, is a human being, and that human being does have the right to live and has, is, a, is, a, is a citizen. Okay. Um, 
can I ask, you said you believe life begins at conception. Um, can I, you said you believe life yeah, uh, begins at conception. Yes, science proves that. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you explain that science then? Yeah, so, so I, I quoted earlier a University of Chicago study mm -hmm. of more than 5,000 biologists, 85% um, of whom said they were Democrat and pro-choice, 95% of whom were PhDs from more than a thousand academic institutions, 96% of them said that human life begins at fertilization at conception when sperm and egg unite because that's when a whole unique human being comes into existence, a unique genetic code comes into existence that's never existed before and will never exist again. Yeah, that's when new cells are formed. But, yes. Um, that's when you became you. I don't have any memory of that because I didn't have any consciousness till about sure. the age of 18 But consciousness doesn't, doesn't make a human. I mean... When you're sleeping, you're not no longer human. You, if you're in a coma, you're not, no I, longer I still human. have REM sleep when I'm asleep, so I'm still having some form of consciousness. A babies in the womb actually have REM sleep at 18 weeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're saying life begins at conception and um, conscious doesn't have anything to do with life, how do you feel about people being taken off life support? That's a good question. And I think that's one that's like hotly debated in mm -hmm. terms of like when it, does actual death occur? Mm -hmm. I, it, it's, I mean, most people would say when there's no brain function, yeah. right? Brain like activity. Uh, yeah. when there's no brain function or when the heart is no longer able to beat on its own. But Usually people, life support is when they're brain dead. Usually yeah. the heart is still beating. But I think we generally, most people, even people would disagree with me about um, preventing abortions at the moment of conception. I think most people, and we find this statistically in polls, would agree with us that, well, when a child's heart is beating, that's pretty indicative that that's a, that's a human being that's alive, that, that there is cardiac activity happening and that's a human being and that's life. Well, there's cardiac activity happening in those who are brain dead, but obviously they mm -hmm. have no life ahead of them. And I mm -hmm. had asked how you felt about that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't know. I won't give you my opinion on, on when death happens because I think it's varying. I mean, I um, think the beginning of life and the end of life are two similar Well, no, I think things. it's different because the- Why when so? The, does death occur? I think if you would have asked people like 20 years ago when death happens versus today, it actually probably changes because of life support and our ability to keep someone else's heart pumping while, you know. I mean, life support existed 20 years ago. Well, I'm, I'm just saying, like, I think that changes because of our medical technology. Mm -hmm. I would say we know definitively, though, that life begins at the moment of conception because that's when something becomes something. You went from nothing or two parts into unique whole. And there's no other point where you can just be like, oh yeah, that blob of tissue, that fetus, that zygote, whatever name you want to give it, suddenly becomes a human being. Like, no, you became you at the moment of conception. At the moment of conception, it was determined the color of your eyes, the color of your skin, the color of your hair, right? Per certain personality traits, certain uh, predispositions to cancer, or diabetes, or, or other things. Th those were all determined right at that point. I'm a little confused because you've said that life has both begun at conception and you associate life with a beating heart, but obviously I said most people who don't would even agree with me. I was just trying to give you like an all. Oh, okay, here. gotcha. Is that I misunderstood? Yeah, I was just saying that. that some people will don't even want to talk about life beginning conception. I'd say, well, you know, a lot of times when we're talking about passing pro-life laws in, a, in our country, what we're certainly talking about right now nationally and in states across the country. Um, you often see a debate about at least, at minimum, preventing abortions when cardiac activity is present, when there's a heartbeat. And I think that's something that even people who don't want to acknowledge the science of conception and when life begins, I think all of us can kind of agree like, duh, where there's a heartbeat, there's clearly life. Does that make sense? I, I would disagree, honestly. Um, well, do, you, do you think that the child in the womb is dead? No, I didn't say that. Well, you said you disagreed. But that it was a they life. don't have consciousness, so I feel like I mean, like if my mom had aborted me, I'd never know any different. Yeah, it still would have been a tragedy, though. I mean, not really. I wouldn't know any different. I, I wouldn't know any like. No, it's, we would I we would say in the pro life movement, if your mom had aborted you, that still would have been a tragedy because you were well, you, you like you, the you, I guess you and you had value. Uh, I mean, I didn't really have any value. I was like this big, so. No, you did have value because you were a member of our human species. You are a, a sister in our like human species with us. 
Uh, I would disagree, but. Well, I, you are human, right? Yeah, now. Yeah. Were you ever not a human? Uh, no, but there was definitely multiple points during um, um, when I was like in utero that had you taken me out, I would not have survived on my own. And even when I, even like almost up to birth, I really had no um, mm -hmm. actual complex brain function. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't really processing anything. But you're still so, a human. Yeah, I'm still a human. But I just don't see it as a tragedy like you put it. I mean, that's just my opinion. But. Sure, yeah. That, I mean, that's fundamentally the pro-abortion position is that. I'm not pro-abortion, I'm pro-choice. Pro-choice for what? To do what? For women to choose um, what is best for them. For women to choose? For women to choose whether abortion. they want to have a baby. No, no. For whether women want to choose whether they have a baby, whether they put up for adoption, whether they have abortion, whatever is the best situation for them. Wait, so you're pro-legal abortion? Um, yes. So you're pro-abortion? No, I am pro-choice. I'm anti-legal abortion. So are you pro-legal abortion or are you anti-legal abortion? I am pro-legal abortion. So but you're pro-abortion. That doesn't mean I'm going to run around and say everybody should have an abortion. No, I didn't say that. But you are okay with abortion existing and happening in the United States of America. Yes. So you're pro-abortion. I think you're twisting my words. Why, but... why are you having a hard time accepting that phrase? Because you're trying to twist my words against me. No, I think the reason you don't want to accept that phrase is because saying you're pro-abortion doesn't sound so great. We naturally, as humans, I mean, I can so, I like can a, certainly stand up here and say I'm pro-abortion, but you're just trying to twist my words. Sorry, okay, words so against me. you admit you're pro-abortion. I am pro-abortion. Okay, thank you. Yep. I am pro-safe legal abortion. Yep, you're pro-abortion. Yep. Yep. Okay, great. I'm anti-abortion, and I'm anti-abortion because I believe you had value at the moment you came into existence. And that's the fundamental pro-life belief that every human being, every member of our species has value and has a fundamentally a right to live. That's, that's, what, that's like the simplistic, that's the entire argument of the pro-life movement mm -hmm. that never changes. That we can debate all kinds of policy prescriptions of how to reduce abortion. We, can, we have varying views on birth control in the pro-life movement, but we all naturally agree that human beings, because science tells us, come into existence at the moment of conception, and because you're a member of our species, you are uniquely valuable and therefore at least worthy of being born. Okay. Does that I, make sense to you? I, I, oh, it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I'm a fairly competent human being. You don't need to contradict me like that but I was just uh, being being clear that okay. you understood where I was coming from I yeah. understand yeah. great do you have other questions um I do but I want to let other people okay. ask questions yeah so. I think when you look at the brain death and the end of life question like I said I don't want to fully go into it because I don't personally feel like I'm an expert in mm -hmm. all medical things and I've and there's and I there's actually varying degrees even in the pro-life movement of of uh, palliative care, end of life, neurosurgeons yeah, that 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 some are pro life, you know, and they even disagree about that in general. Mm -hmm. I would say though, to go back to your original question, I think it's a question of like letting someone die versus like actively killing them. And we we know from science, ease, it's very easy to point to science to say that at conception, unique human life comes into existence, and that is a life, and we believe that life is worthy of living. And yes. We believe and we know because of um, the 14th Amendment's own citizenship clause that Congress does have the ability to define who are citizens. And they mm. can easily go back and say, yes, the 14th Amendment apply, applies to preborn human beings and we're going to stop discriminating against human beings simply because of their size or their location or their age. I just want to say, for future reference, Congress wouldn't do that. Um, that would be a matter with the Supreme Court. If they wanted Cong to amend the Constitution, would, then that would go through either Congress, Congress and then the states or just the states. But as far as clarifying the 14th Amendment, that would be the Supreme Court. No, it would be an act of Congress. In the 14th Amendment, it says an act of Congress. Yes. But so if they, an act of Congress. Okay. And it, it would immediately go to the, you know, if there was a Biden administration, an act of Congress would, so for example, there's a Life of Conception Act that's right now in the House of Representatives, in the Senate, it's been introduced for years. It has, mm -hmm. you know, has the most co-sponsors of any pro-life bill. When that bill gets passed, that's what that bill will do. It will say, we find that the pre-born human being, they have equal rights 
under the 14th Amendment. And then if there was the Biden administration uh, and the weaponized DOJ, Merrick Garland would immediately appeal that to the Supreme Court. So it's yeah, not it's going the to Biden go to the Biden administration court. doesn't really have anything to do with what cases are going through the federal court system. No, they do. They appeal cases all the oh, time. Oh, no. They, so they yes. got, they're getting involved right now in the chemical abortion Oh, no. Case. They definitely are able to appeal yeah, cases. So that is the Biden administration. That's Merrick Garland. But it would probably go through either way, even if there wasn't a Biden administration, because other people could also push it through appeal systems. Sure, other people could, but the Biden, any Democratic presidential yeah. candidate, whether it's Gavin Newsom or Kamal Harris, or if Joe Biden survives for another you know, four or six years, whatever, it, there are, they would definitely lead that charge. And they've been very clear about that because they don't mm. see a child in the womb as deserving of equal rights as we do. Yeah, I mean, I agree with them. But. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a discriminatory view, but, but you can hold it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hi. So um, I was, I need to talk about the first, no, the second person's question. Uh, she asked about contracept contraceptives. Um, do you are you anti contraceptive? We actually don't take a position at Students for Life on barometric contraceptives. Okay. Because you know ethically, there's no um, chance that you could be killing a human being. Um, we we do advise caution on anything that's a hormonal contraceptive, an IUD, an IUD uh, the shot, Depo-Provera, uh, you know, birth control pill, morning after pill, because we do know, according to their own labeling, that a third function of hormonal contraceptives can be to thin out the lining of the uterus to make the uterus an inhospitable place for unique mm -hmm. human life. Because human life usually begins in the fallopian tube. The egg has been released, sperm makes its way, human life, the spark of life begins, unique genetic code comes into existence, that child then travels down the fallopian tube and then implants, you know, it can be hours or days I later. I understand how this life. works. You don't need to explain this again. Well, I'm explaining to everybody here because I think it gets confusing for people. Okay, I have one more question. Sure. <laughs> so you, do, you convince a woman to keep her baby um, she puts the baby into foster care, the foster care, and then abuses the child. I've dealt firsthand with foster care children. I can understand how ruthless it can be. What can you do for that child, or do you not care because it's been born? I think that's, first of all, that's a very loaded assumption that you're making that pro-lifers, who I've already demonstrated, care a lot about human beings. Because our fundamental premise in the pro-life movement, as I've said multiple times now, is that all human beings are equally valuable. Yes, but I don't really see like any pro-life helping the foster care. Did you, no, the, the, my last point, I talked about how our organization, our sister organization, Students Life Action, which I'm also the president of, we are actually actively writing legislation and trying to figure out ways to um, fix gaps in our foster care system. We actually okay. introduced a law here uh, in 2019 in Virginia, which we actually had a pro-life and pro-choice legislature, leg legislative members actually co-sponsor equally. The bill was killed, uh, but the bill was not an anti-abortion bill. Mm -hmm. All it would do would actually make home, would speed up home study visits because of what it said was, um, you know, anybody who had been entrusted with the care of minors in the state of Virginia, uh, firemen, police officers, teachers could be trained to do home study visits. Mm -hmm. And because we knew that there was a big backlog because there's a lack of social workers who can do the home study visits, which home study visits are very important because if you want to be an adoptive parent, if you want to be a foster parent, you have to have your home checked out that you're not a crazy person. But there's a long wait sometimes. Or if something happens and the person has to go back and like fix something, then they have to wait. So our thought was, well, let's just speed up the home study process. Mm -hmm. That bill was killed. I was completely like annihilated in the Washington Post by both pro-life and pro-abortion people because how dare us try to speed up the home study process. So that's why we've actually have a whole team right now of researchers and lawyers working with uh, foster care advocates and adoption advocates who some of them are pro-life, some of them aren't pro-life, who are actually trying to write legislation that the entire pro-life movement can get behind and promote that will have consensus around those movements. Because I, I think when we boil down the issue of foster care and adoption, we tend to oversimplify. And those, those are movements themselves that are very divisive and have very big policy disagreements within each of those movements. And I think we have to like know what those disagreements are before we start weighing in, because I learned my lesson when I did okay. that. So what about kids that are like kids that are born and stay with their biological families and are abused and starved? Like and just mm -hmm. Suffering. You can't do anything for them. Yeah. Like, yeah. 
Do you think that anybody who's going to suffer should be killed? I think they'd be better off never born than dying from starvation or dying from abuse. How do you know they're going to die from starvation? I don't, but do there's a, a really ball? high chance. If like they're being abused and they do die from starvation. Do you think that's making starvation. assumptions? Yes, no. Now what happens when you make assumptions? It's not a good thing to make assumptions. To say that I'm just we, not, I'm not assuming anything. I'm saying if that no, child you just, does die. No, you just you just said you were assuming. Because like no, you can look I didn't throughout understand. our human history. Look at Barack Obama. If you looked at like the stats surrounding Barack Obama's conception and being born, if you, many pro-abortion advocates have been like, "Yep, abort him." But he became our first black president. Is one of the most you know he won the Nobel Peace Prize. I don't know for what, but he's widely acclaimed to be a world leader. And we would all agree, even though I think he's terribly wrong of almost every policy prescription, I would agree with anybody that he has the fundamental right to, to life and to live. And I don't think that because we may think someone may suffer, that therefore it's better to just prescribe a blanket abortion policy or say, oh, we should just need more abortion for people like those. I think that's making assumptions. I think that's playing God. I think that's denying reality that all of us are going to suffer in our lifetime. And I think it's an extremist position to take to say, you may suffer, therefore you're better off dead because all of us are going to suffer. And I think you and I would agree that if there's a two-year-old child whose mom is addicted to crack cocaine or meth, the child enters foster care, it's a terrible abusive situation, maybe goes back to the family, maybe another family member, because that's the point of foster care, right? It's not adoptions, but it's supposed to be family reunification. Um, we would agree that that child has value and we should fight for that child. None of us in the room, pro-life or pro-abortion, anti-abortion or pro-abortion, would say, well, this child has a really shitty life at two. It's just going to get worse. They're going to have a higher likelihood to end up in jail, to be doing drugs themselves. Let's just euthanize that two-year-old child. None of Not us what would I was saying, that. but I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, okay. because, yeah, my argument is, Suffering is bad, and we don't want anyone to suffer. But I don't think because we think a person may suffer that justifies an extremist position of prescribing death to them. Okay. Thank you. Sleep that <laughs> Do you have a question? Yo it's, it seems it seems that it it's a heart issue. You know, there's many people. You know, it says offenses will come, but don't take offense, and woe to those who bring offense. Um, that a root of bitterness defiles many. And there's you know, and and people have reason, you know, to be bitter in that. But I believe that also God can give the ability to forgive. Because through, I mean, people have been violated, people who have been abused, people who have been neglected, misused, you know? And because of that, the hurt and the pain, mm -hmm. the acid in the heart mm -hmm. causes people to not think clearly, you know, and end up taking a side mm -hmm. on the side of ill will instead of the side of good because of the poison in the heart. I agree with you. Do you have a question? Yeah. Sorry. Well, I agree with you, but it's... Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm just... You know, I mean, I agree with you, and I also think you have to think about um, when you're talking about abortion and changing your own abortion is hard. Because I changed my mind several years ago about the death penalty. I went from being pro-death penalty to anti-death penalty. When I made that decision to change my mind on the death penalty, it was fairly easy to make that choice. Like, it didn't affect me. It didn't affect a daily choice I was making. It didn't affect the sexual relationship I was having with my husband, right? It didn't change anything. I just simply had to say, well, no, you know, I disagree with you more often to some of my friends, right? Um, I think when we're talking about abortion, not only do you have hardness and bitterness because all of us, you know, and some of us more than others have suffered already in our lives that make us more okay with saying, oh, it's better if I were never born or this child was never born, which is a terrifyingly sad thing to say. Uh, but I also think changing your mind about abortion is, is kind of scary 
because changing your mind about abortion, especially as a young person, might mean you have to change some of your behaviors. Yeah. And that makes it that makes it even harder to admit maybe I maybe I'm wrong on this issue. Yeah, well, and but I mean we're changing. I mean our decisions and our choices are are changing and evolving as we're you know as we're mm -hmm. maturing anyway, yep. um, or at least they should. And uh, you know, and so there's you know people have that choice, but like mm -hmm. you had said before, you know about the the four legs you know mm -hmm. i've i've heard that anything that has more than two heads is a monster mm -hmm. right i mean mm -hmm. and but i mean aside from the fact of a mother and her baby mm -hmm. but otherwise it's outside of that but i think that with it with a change of heart like you said it, it takes courage but sometimes people have been promoted you know that hey if they just have an education everything will be wonderful or if they have mm -hmm. this or that everything will well. be wonderful and sometimes you know maybe they need to close the legs and make the choice to say hey okay you know That's so the baby is the result you have a question of Sorry. that and um, so would it not be an uh you know an um uh, uh um, to make the would it not be right to consider that before? No. And so therefore, yes. through the convenience, I mean, many, it seems as though because education or money or whatever has been mm -hmm. esteemed so high a value mm -hmm. that people have actually put a child as an inconvenience. Yep, that's right. And something that's in the way as yep. far as yeah. a blessing. You know. Do you have a question for me? Because other people are trying to ask questions. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, um, no, I We, we just, can talk later, though. Yeah. All right, I've, thank you. I said what I said. Thank you. Um, Hi. Hello. This is uh, terrifying. I'm not, like, smart. <laughs> you can do it. It's too high. This is a, a too much of a... Is it height discriminatory it's towards you? Octopus. <laughs> yeah, just yes. No, it needs to be like. Which way does she? Oh. Oh. It's just the clip. It's fine. Sorry, I have like a friend who's really into microphones, and they're like, if it's that way, you'll sound horrible. Okay. <laughs> it's fine. You sound fine um, to me. Uh, I disagreed maybe had questions for some of your definitions what? you defined and i'm like i could be totally wrong i'm not a good listener abortion is the violent removing or killing by a privileged actor mm -hmm. um and that oh gosh i forgot is what abortion I was say about do, you, that. do you disagree I'm, that it's violent I'm disagreeing that that is the definition of abortion because like, uh, I know this is like weird and semantics, but I feel like it's important mm -hmm. um, that abortion is the end of a pregnancy, pregnancy? fetus, a, whatever. Yeah. So I was talking about so, direct abortion. So, so um, direct abortion mm -hmm. is not like that's, Medicated abortion, is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. Like medical no, abortion? you can have a spontaneous abortion. So a spontaneous right, abortion a is considered a natural miscarriage, right? Yeah. Uh, Just like giving birth is but, an end of pregnancy. But then later you said something about miscarriages that was like um, abortion isn't miscarriages. Right. Direct abortion, abortion is not. No, you said abortion isn't miscarriage. I'm sorry, direct like, abortion is not a miscarriage. Okay. When we, when you, I'm using yeah. the common vernacular, right? The common vernacular is when you talk about abortion, abortion is the ending of a pregnancy. A woman is choosing to pay someone else to end the life of, her, of another human being. And the, uh, the person who's doing the abortion, the abortionist, will only know abortion. success in a job if a unique whole living human being is then d dies in the procedure. No matter so what you're the saying procedure that is. that, um, that, that's, I'm that, using the common vernacular abortion. Okay. But I'm not well, disagreeing with a, you that question. miscarriage is called spontaneous abortion. Okay. But I can be, I, heard, I could be better yes. about just saying direct abortion or intentional abortion. So I'm referring to a direct or intentional abortion. Okay. Fuck, now I forgot. Um, uh, uh, so are you, 
implying or saying or arguing that the doctor or the abortionist themselves, the one with the um, uh, forceps and the, These, the curette. Yep, yep. Yeah. Is that what that's called? A this curette? is a sofa clamp. Sometimes they call these forceps. Ooh, uh, and then fine. this is a curette, the loop shaped one. Okay. Can I, is there, can there be a tactile part of this? That just looks really cool. I'm sorry. Sure. Do um, you want me to, do you, do you want me to let you touch the abortion tool? Can I touch the abortion tool? Oh my gosh. Sure. You can't step inside the box. You'll get in trouble. So this is very sharp. If you put your finger, this is what latches onto the fetus's limbs. Okay. And see, it locks. I'm not going to do it because it would hurt you. No, you can do it a little bit. No, I'm not going to do it. But see, it locks. You hear it lock. And then you twist and right. you pull. So this is what's used in a D&E abortion. This is a curette. See how it's kind of sharp, but not too sharp. It's a curette. That's the loop-shaped device. And so that's scraped on the lining of the uterus. That's used in a D&C. And that's also used in a D&E abortion. What's the purpose of having this? So this scrapes the lining of the uterus to ensure, so like, and this is a D&E no, like abortion. for you to bring them. To, to show you what abortion is. Because I think a lot of times we talk about okay. abortion. I'll take it back now. Yeah. A lot of times we talk about abortion, but I think, um, especially when I show people who support abortion, what abortion is, people will start singing God Bless America, put earplugs in, start yelling at me, telling them I'm doing a fear tactic. I think it's important that if you support abortion, you have to know what abortion is and you have to be willing to tolerate being taught about what abortion is. The reason why I'm against the death penalty and why I changed my view on the death penalty was because I looked into what happens and I couldn't tolerate that. Um, so I think as you support abortion, you should be totally okay with learning and seeing, and there's videos online and I'm not gonna get graphic and show you a video, um, but seeing what abortion really is uh, and what happens. Uh, do you have an, check my microphone. Yeah, you're done with your question, right? You sat down? It was, I just okay, so. I know, I'm just checking. It's good. No, it's still on. Yeah. Hi. Alrighty. Uh, thank you, Kristen, for being here. Um, I, so I'm going to admit I am a pro-lifer. Um, and something that I'm about to say, I think, is something that both sides have seen. That, like, mm -hmm. in general, when it comes to talking about abortion, it can be very hard um, encountering the person. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about how to best encounter those who support abortion, mm -hmm. um, the goal being to understand their story, their mm -hmm. suffering, and affirm their intense value as a person while having this conversation. Yeah, I think the best way to do it um, is either via the privacy of the computer, uh, where you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation on social media, your you know, you're sending educational information to that person so they can process it themselves um, and really think about it themselves without having to like quickly having a response because changing your mind on something's hard and you might have to like look up facts and be like, well, that's contrary to what I've ever heard. Let me go open up another browser and Google what I just heard. Um, I think the other best way is one-on-one -on -one conversations. I think that's, uh, to be honest with you, I think that's the best way, is having a personal conversation with somebody, stating your opinion, hearing their opinion. Often in the, in the pro-life movement, we hear a lot of stories, right? Uh, sometimes I don't want to know all the stories, and I get told a lot of very graphic details sometimes about people's sex lives that I never, ever asked for. Um, but I have to listen to them because they're telling me why they feel the way that they do, and then to challenge that person on their beliefs and say, well, have you ever considered this? Have you ever looked this up? Have you ever gone to chat GDP and typed in this question, right? Um, I don't think uh, this type of presentation is like the best one to change minds. I think this, present, this type of, uh, of hardened pro-choice, pro-abortion minds, I think this type of presentation that I'm doing um, is very important for the people who are in the audience who don't ask a question, who I get to watch, and in my, it's my personal enjoyment, um, I get to watch the light bulbs go off in your heads when I talk. Um, because those are the minds that we change at presentations, or that I, I've been, I feel, and I know I've been able to change. It's not actually the people actually ask the questions. It's often them asking the question, me giving an answer, and them actually going, wait a minute, they said this, she said this, that didn't sound right. Oh my gosh, I am pro-life. <laughs> okay. Oh no, I'm one of the crazy pro-lifers. <laughs> okay. I'm sure that goes through people's minds. Yeah. No, thank you. Next question. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, given how much of the 
uh, Christian nationalist and white supremacist movement aligns itself with the uh, pro-life movement as a means of combating the idea of white genocide. Okay. No, I, I, Please I, give I, me your sources yeah. from how the uh, white I, supremacist movement is. No, I didn't say you're not a white supremacist just for being pro-life. I just said that there's some people in we white. We said su- given. Where is no, your source that uh, white supremacist movement is partnering with the pro-life movement? I didn't say partnering. I just said aligns itself with as a means of combating white genocide. And there's a greater part to this. So I just want to implore everyone in this room and anyone that may be watching there, there, or there to read Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, letter from Birmingham jail. Amen. The, I agree with you, brother. The autobiography of Malcolm X and uh, the 1619 Project. That's, so the yeah. letter from Birmingham jail is like the most quoted mm-hmm. source I use when I give public presentations, when I'm encouraging mm-hmm. Christians specifically yep. to rise up and fight against the injustice of abortion. Yep. I because, think we should be fighting against into- it, intolerance wherever it may be. Say, right? He mm-hmm. said it wasn't the Ku Klux Klan or the citizens counselor that he was most concerned about. It was the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who preferred a negative peace, which is the absence mm-hmm. rather than of justice, and a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. Absence I, of I absolutely agree. I absolutely I, agree that. Uh, absolutely. I love you. You're liberal, my favorite moderate, question of the day. Moderate liberals are absolutely, uh, what's it called, a force that should not be taken lightly when it comes to real change in this country. And uh, yeah, there wasn't really a question. I just wanted to get on my soapbox and make sure everyone was aware to really go out there and fight intolerance wherever it may or may not be. Yeah, thank you. I would say that the white supremacist movement is not welcome in the pro-life movement. I'm not denying that there are white supremacists. I've driven through the South and seen some of the billboards. Um, it's very scary. Um, but that is not the pro-life movement. Uh, that is not who the pro-life movement is. That actually to be a white supremacist would be antithetical to being pro-life to say that all human beings have equal value. Uh, so to be a white supremacist, uh, you cannot actually say that you are part of the pro-life movement because you can't say that every human life is equally valuable. You can't do that if you're a white supremacist. But absolutely, the white moderate uh, is the most concerning thing people that I have, those who prefer the absence of tension to the presence of justice. And that is why exactly in the pro-life movement, we are on the streets, we're in communities, we're on college campuses. It is exactly why I came back here at VCU today, even though my husband is pissed off at me that I'm here, that I put myself at physical risk to come back to this campus. Why? Because I refuse to be part of the moderate who wants the absence of tension. I want to be part of the group that demands the presence of justice, and that means tension. It has to be around. Next question. Hello. Hi. Um, earlier you were talking about um, like the forced abortion issue when you were talking about like Plan B and everything. And um, I grew up with a woman, like a teenager grew up with, who ran away from home because of, um, she had a couple of forced abortions, so she ran away and she gave birth to her son while living with us. So I'm wondering, like, what kind of things do your organizations do? Like, I'm um, interested in like the tangible, like, sure. what is it you do and how can people get involved with that kind of thing? Yeah, so one of the things I said was that, but I don't know if you were part of the whole presentation or if you came in at the end, but that our job, we see our job in the public generation as twofold. Changing minds about the violence of abortion because we are the ones being targeted by the abortion industry, so we're the best spokespersons to talk about it. Then the other half is transforming the culture so no woman ever feels like she has to have an abortion. So as part of that moral obligation, I feel that pro-lifers have. Students for Life launched an entity um, 12 years ago, I think, 13 years ago, called Standing With You. Standing with you. If you go to standingwithyou.org, it's a website we built that lists federally qualified health centers, the more than 3,000 pregnancy centers and maternity homes. You can put in your zip code, you can start a live chat, or you can place a phone call, and any woman or man in a crisis, pregnancy, parenting situation can find the help that they need that is nonviolent. One of the resources on that website specifically, and I don't have this specific page, but if you go down, it's in the menu bar. It says, are you being forced into having an abortion? And we actually put women uh, into communication with a whole legal team. They're based out of Texas. They're called the Justice Foundation, who they have a whole initiative just to help young women who are being forced into having abortion by their partners or their parents. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank, thank you so much for coming. I, I am pro-life. I um, was a nurse, and then I um, retired grandmother. So you could have done this nine. better than me, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I, I wanted to say, um, I stand in front of Planned Parenthood week by week, and you know we get screamed at a lot. And you know, we're, I just want to say we're trying to help mm -hmm. um, to offer them other choices besides you know killing their child. I, I had a crisis pregnancy myself, and seven lives wouldn't be here if I hadn't um, had help. So um, I really appreciated though. Um, the people who came that were pro-choice because I want to know their issue. I don't get a chance to talk to them because they just mm -hmm. scream at us or go mm -hmm. on by and they're angry. Yeah. But I want to hear, I really do want to hear what their issue is and so we could talk about it. But the two quick questions I have were, one, could you speak to um, the, the people who survive abortions and the people who were conceived in rape, mm. because I hear from the pro-life organizations, they have value, and there's a lot of them out there mm -hmm. that have survived abortions and that have survived and survive rape, and they feel their life has value, mm -hmm. and not where they how they were conceived. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, um, just quickly speak to these laws that people are saying we're forcing them to do this or that when they're forcing the whole medical profession against their deeply held beliefs to either kill children or have to lose their jobs pharmacists, nurses, right. et cetera. You are 100% right. And then sadly, uh, Javier Becerra, our HHS secretary, uh, who is not a medical professional, um, he's the abortionist activist who pretends he's a medical professional. He's a lawyer who heads up HHS. He and President Biden have basically said in every possible way, either actually saying it and also through administrative decree, that medical professionals who will not participate in abortion have no place serving in the medical field. That's crazy. That's fundamentally an anti-American statement that they have, they're trying to erase the right of conscience, the right of religious beliefs. That's unbelievable. It's gonna continue until probably it's gonna be another persecuted minority religious person, like a Muslim nurse to say, hey, I don't wanna commit abortion. And then they'll be like, oh, wait a minute, intersexualism, what do we do now? I don't know. Uh, that's, that's what it's gonna take because they don't care about Christians and they've made that very clear. Um, so I, I thank you for bringing that up because I think that's a very, very important part, part, point. And it's something that we've certainly noticed in the pro-life movement and working with young people across the country. Uh, so many students who are pre-med who will come up to me saying, I don't know if I'm going to medical school now. I might just go get my master's of science. I might become a researcher because I don't want to be in that position to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a medical degree and then be sued and lose my job um, and lose my house and my livelihood. So I, I would thank you for that. There are groups, there's the Abortion Survivors Network. Uh, they're actually, we're very honored to be working with Melissa Odin. Um, there are um, incubated group this year at Students for Life. So they received a grant from Students for Life and we're helping them. They are a national network of people who are adults in America today who were actually aborted, but miraculously survived abortion. So in February, the House of Representatives uh, voted against uh, a bill. Um, well, well, the House of Representatives voted for a bill. It actually passed. Every single Democrat except one voted in a no position uh, against the infanticide bill. This bill would criminalize um, medical workers who, if a child was born accidentally during an abortion, so a failed abortion, it would say you as a abortionist, a nurse in the abortion facility, are legally obligated to call 911. You're legally obligated to provide as much life-sustaining care as you can. Every single Democrat in the House of Representatives, minus one, voted against that law. And they are on record, and they've done this multiple times. It passed the House of Representatives because the Republicans have the majority, but it has no chance in passing right now because we have a Democrat-controlled Senate. That is where uh, Democrats are in our national uh, conversation about abortion. They are willing to take a position that more than 90% of Americans, when they find out about it, are absolutely disgusted and concerned about. But abortion survivors absolutely exist. I think their story is very important. The CDC, although we don't have a national abortion reporting law, I talked about that earlier, we believe there are 
tens of thousands, according to the CDC's own stats, of people who are alive today, walking this earth, who are actually born alive because of a failed abortion. I mean, abortionists are kind of not like the cream of the crop of uh, doctors anyway. And there's a long history of all of the um, violations that abortionists commit. Um, so I'm actually not surprised that some of them suck at killing babies too, but I'm really happy that they suck at killing babies. So, so there you go. Next question. Hey, um, so a lot of people will align uh, an, octa an ectopic pregnancy uh, kind of the same as uh, in the same line as an abortion and I've even had a abortion worker mm. kind of align that um, and you know uh, it was it was very fast conversation sure so not an, not a lot of time um, how would you I guess quickly say well okay like that's you know an ectopic pregnancy is not and abortion, I mean, I guess, would you, I mean, how, sure. how would you explain that? Because yeah, I was surprised so, it, was, it was an abortion worker who was telling me that. It was like, you should know better. Yeah, I mean, so when there's an ectopic pregnancy, I, I, did, I, I don't know if you were here when I addressed this earlier, because some people came in late, yeah. but there is no, there's no chance that the child's going to survive. It has been attempted. I actually know an OBGYN who's attempted to remove the child from the fallopian tube and try to implant the child into the uterine lining at the request of his mother. It's never worked. One day, it might work. But right now, there's no way that we can remove a child from the fallopian tube and get that child to implant into the uterine lining successfully to, to remain alive. Um, so we wouldn't consider that, as I clarified to the woman who walked out, that that wouldn't be considered a direct abortion, an intentional abortion. Because I think when we talk about life, um, mm -hmm. the life circumstances of mothers, that women who are pregnant with a wanted pregnancy and have a circumstance arise later in pregnancy where their life is threatened, there's nobody in the pro-life movement, there's no national pro-life organization, there's no pro-life pro legislation that's written that says she must be forced to gestate the human even though it's gonna kill her. What we would say and what doctors would, would do and pro-life OBGYNs that I personally know and have a relationship with who some of them were former abortionists will say is the question for the, abortion, for the OBGYN is what is their intent? Your intention as a doctor, as a medical professional, is to treat both patients and to see both patients survive. And if that's not possible, to at least see one patient sur to survive. So the intent is not directly to go in and to end the life of a child who's implanted in his or her mother's fallopian tube. The intent is to help see that mother not die. The child will die, but you're not going in and, and you're not directly ending their life the child is indirectly going to die. But the intention is vastly different from a, from a direct abortion, the common vernacular of abortion, which is the intent of the abortionist is to end the beating heart of another human being. It's to end life, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And you, you answered my I other I think question. it's sad because the pro-abortion movement uses the tragedy of miscarriage uh, of ectopic pregnancy to gaslight women. And we saw this immediately after the Roe decision where um, there was a woman, I can't, she was married to, I'm not a culture person, helped me out, had a natural miscarriage like 27 weeks. She's married to R&B singer. Yes, so Christy Teigen had a very public, sad situation a couple years ago. It was either a natural miscarriage or stillbirth of their child, and she was late in pregnancy. And, and the whole nation mourned with her, right? After Roe was reversed, we all know she's a pro-abortion advocate, she was like, oh, I had an abortion. <laughs> no, there was an ending of the pregnancy. You had a spontaneous abortion if it was a miscarriage. But no, you didn't actually have an abortion. And I think it's so sick that the abortion lobby is so desperate for support. They're trying to tell any woman who suffered the pain and the tragedy of a natural miscarriage or the pain and tragedy of ectopic pregnancy that they are actually part of the abortion industry. Oh, don't worry, you're actually with us. You've had an abortion. You've benefited from this. That's gaslighting and absolutely sickening. Does yeah. that help? Yeah, it does. And you also answered my other question of like, is there any uh, dignity or hope uh, for the child? Uh, like, you mm -hmm. know, is there any 
way yeah. that they could just like grasp it. And you answered that question by that OB who was yeah. trying to, who was trying to. Yeah. And one. many women that I know of who yeah. had miscarriages yeah. or have experienced the tragedy, ectopic pregnancy, they will hold funerals. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there are caskets Absolutely. made for children who are miscarried. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think it's sad that you know, so many women in our country have endured a natural miscarriage, mm -hmm. a spontaneous abortion, as mm -hmm. they call it, um, and we don't talk about it. It's like this yeah. thing that's like, no one ever talks about it. Mm -hmm. because we don't, and everyone gets kind of like awkward about talking about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But why aren't we remembering these lives of these human beings? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I actually uh, did have a miscarriage and they, uh, and they say one of the things, I don't know if I'm misquoting, uh, I, I don't know if I'm misquoting, but I've heard that people say, oh, the number one thing that you feel uh, when you have a abortion is um, relief. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, the number one, the very first thing that I did feel when we had miscarriage was relief because it was like, it's done, it's over with. Yeah. I can't do anything about it. I don't have to stress about it because we knew it was coming for about two weeks. Yeah. It's like, I, there's nothing we can do. I, it's done. It's over. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Mm -hmm. They don't talk about what everything after. else after. Yeah. And we don't talk about after. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we don't want to talk about it because talking about the pain of natural miscarriage, of mm -hmm. losing your child, yeah. talking about how women suffer and mm -hmm. mourn a loss of a child who's five, six, seven, eight weeks old normally mm -hmm. would undermine their entire movement that abortion is simply nothing. It's the removal of meaningless blobs of tissue. So we can't mm -hmm. talk about miscarriage. We can't help women heal from the pain of natural miscarriage because if we do, it undermines their whole argument that abortion is nothing. Yeah, yeah. So, that's right. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. And you said that uh, maybe women are more awesome than men. I think we help each other be badass. So. Yes, there you go. <laughs> I think we You're help nice each other. You're a nicer person than I am. Awesome. How are you doing? Good. Um, so what would you say the end goal is? To eliminate abortion across the United States legally? Yes. Our end goal in the pro-life movement is to make abortion unthinkable and also unavailable. I think it's impossible to eliminate the thought from people. Um, so just using that, you would never really be able to stop abortion. Mm -hmm. So why not try slavery to make it as safe as possible? happens in our country, right? Sure. But, but why we, not try to make We have made it... slavery an unthinkable thing. It still happens because there's still evil bastards out there. Sure. But we have made it illegal. We have made it culturally unthinkable. And we still have to fight against it. So I, I think we definitely have a Are vision. Are you talking about removing the concept of abortion? Yeah, we're, we're, we are going to change, we are going to change culture in our country that in 50 years in our country, when our grandchildren hear the word abortion and think back to this time in history, they're going to go, my God, what were they thinking? That was a human being that was part of our species and they callously threw these human beings away and flushed them down the toilet or incinerated them. Okay. That wasn't my question. Um, going forward, how if the process of abortion is illegal and the only methods left are ones that are harmful or unhealthy, mm -hmm. then what do you do then? Because mm -hmm. you're never going to stop it. It's the same thing with drugs, the same thing sure. with guns. Banning guns, people are still going to find a gun. Banning drugs, people are still going to find drugs. It doesn't stop it. So how would you stop abortion? You can't. It's impossible. Do you think laws banning slavery are bad? No. Why? Because people are still trying to enslave human beings. They don't enslave people here. It's illegal. No, no, they actually do. Slavery exists all throughout our country. Where? Human trafficking, my friend. And it's illegal. It's illegal, but it still happens. Okay. So are you against laws that ban slavery? Because it still happens. And it may make it even more dangerous because the victims of human trafficking are trapped in basements across the country. So are you going to incriminate and like you know, prosecute people that just have abortions? No, that's not, we, we as I began at the beginning. In the beginning? Texas, the abortion bill or law or whatever it is there, it's a fine. You get fined for having an abortion. W women do not get penalized for seeking an abortion the in Texas. The doctors do. 
the doctors do. Absolutely, because the people murdering people should well, be put in jail. There? I pass laws that the criminalize woman, abortion for those who commit abortion. The woman went the there doctors. first. The woman went there to get an abortion. But why was she sent there? Because she was she sent wasn't there. sent there, she chose to why go there. Why did she choose to go there? Because, because the misogynistic she feel like she culture can told her a she wasn't strong enough to choose both. That she oh, couldn't so she can do choose both. Now. You remember how I talked earlier? If she can earlier? choose, then why can't she choose to have a baby or to not have a baby? about how women were conscripted in this movement and told that they had to choose abortion in order to no succeed? No one's telling people that they have to choose abortion. No, they absolutely are. That's what we've been doing for 50 years in our country, telling women they can't achieve their education or career goals unless they have an abortion, that you no can't do that. it both. That they absolutely, trust me. Who? I, are you trying to negate my personal experience as a woman? Because no. as a woman, any woman here has certainly been told well, you know, do you really want to have that kid right now? It's not a really good time at work. You know, maybe two is enough. You don't really need three. Do you think you can really handle it? That's the lived experience of American women who try and are seeking to have children in our country. That we're constantly questioned as to whether or not can we actually do it. That's the lived experience. No one's telling people to go out and get abortions. They're telling people, they're Yeah, we're they are. No. The Pro There's whole cho marketing pro campaigns. Pro-choice is the name, right? Choice. The choice to have an abortion, to give adoption, like she said earlier, to give a child to adoption, to abort a, a child, to, I don't know, have a kid if they want to. That's what people want. They want the freedom for a woman to I, choose what they want to do. I don't and think you're anyone trying to, has no, the you're freedom trying to get to rid of the woman's the right to choose being. if she wants to have her child to choose, or not. To choose to kill her child. I don't think It doesn't matter if she the kills right. the child or not. The child is this big. It can't think. It's not sentient. Mm -hmm. It has no thoughts. So you're saying, so you, so you believe that abortion is killing a child? No. Abortion is removing cells. I'm a bunch of cells. What's the difference? The difference is you have a brain that functions and you can speak, have thoughts, and you're uh -huh. sentient. A clump of cells inside of a woman's womb is not sentient. It has no life yet. So you, you, you believe that human beings only have value based on certain levels of brain function? No. That's what you just said. No. You said the ability to speak life. I said the ability to be sentient. When do you believe human beings have a fundamental right to be born? After they can think after they have so can babies after they've been born like two hours after they're born th think can they have yeah they respond thought? to stimuli babies in the womb respond to stimuli have you ever seen an I've ultrasound seen, after a certain period of time no one's aborting a baby that's like huge yeah they actually do i was so monday i was at, i was at the university of new mexico in albuquerque new mexico okay albuquerque new mexico for a long time has been known as one of the late-term abortion do you know that those abortions are illegal no no they're at, let me finish. Let me finish Abortions my statement. Of a full Here, guys, child I will. I'll, I'll debate them. No, you're wrong because in many states across the country, abortion is legal up until the moment of birth. And so thank I, God. Okay. So you're okay with aborting a child at 36 weeks? Sure. When the child's fully formed and can survive outside the womb. Is it going to kill the mother if no. it is born? No. Well, then she can have the baby if she wants to. She wait, can wait, have wait, the wait, choice. Wait, wait. Oh, wait. So if a mother is not experiencing a life-threatening complication and she's 36 weeks pregnant, which is full term, if she's not experiencing life-threatening pregnancy, pregnancy situation, maybe her boyfriend breaks up with her, um, she's been, her house has been foreclosed on, if she goes to Dr. William Hearn in Boulder, Colorado, if she goes to the Southwestern Women's Office in Al Albuquerque, and she says, I just don't want to have this abortion, this baby anymore, I have an abortion. Has she done anything wrong at 36 weeks? So I couldn't hear you, I was talking to that guy. So if a woman's not experiencing a life-threatening pregnancy complication, mm -hmm. she's full term, she's 36, 37 weeks, she loses her job, her house has been foreclosed on, she goes to Dr. William Hearn or Leroy Carhartt or Southwest Women Option, these are places that do abortions into the ninth month of pregnancy across the country, you can Google them. Um, has she done anything wrong? So but do you, you think if she wants to get rid of that baby, she's not going to find a way to do it? So, but I'm just trying to understand where your position is because I'm trying to find common ground. Well, going you back believe abortion in the ninth point, month is morally okay for any reason. Going back to my original point, if a woman wants to get an abortion, she shouldn't have to go through unhealthy and illegal ways to do mm -hmm. it. 
Well, okay, so women die of legal abortions here in the United States every year. Do you know sure. that? Sure, then why don't we pursue methods to make it safer and healthier? Because it's, 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 and they have, the abortion industry tries, I think some abortionists really do try to make abortion um, non-lethal, non-life-threatening to, to mothers. But mistakes happen, especially when you go in later, the later in, the later in pregnancy you commit an abortion, uh, the higher risk it is to her life. So that is fact. Um, but you have to understand, so people die, women die now in America of legal abortions. Yeah. So why would, why would I then have to keep abortion? So you're arguing abortion must be legal because your fundamental premise is abortion must be legal because if it's not legal, lots of women are going to die in back alleys. Is that your premise? I would say more are, yeah. Okay, so let's look at the statistics in the 1960s. So. The award-winning statistician from Planned Parenthood, Christopher Teets, who won the Margaret Sanger Award in 1974, you can go to the Washington Post and Google this. So Christopher Teets was an abortion statistician. Abortion supporting statistician won Planned Parenthood's highest honor. They don't give away the Margaret Sanger Award anymore because they don't want anyone to think about Margaret Sanger because everyone now knows she's a genesis. But they used to give out every year, I think Nancy Pelosi was the last person to win it, they gave out the Margaret Sanger Award. Christopher Teets got their award in 1974. He did a whole bunch, a plethora of research within the 1960s about abortion laws and how they affect the mortality, mortality of women who are pregnant. Um, there were a bunch of rumors leading up to the legalization of abortion until Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton, the two Supreme Court decisions that legalized abortion for any reason up till the moment of birth in 1973. There were a bunch of rumors spread by two men, Larry Ladder, Bernard Nathanson, the two men who co-founded the National Association of Appeal Abortion Laws. Today it's called NARAL Pro-Choice America. Those two men, one was the biographer of Margaret Sanger and who believed that the world was going to experience a population bomb in the 1970s, so he believed we need abortion in terms of population control, which never happened. The world's actually underpopulated. And the other person, Bernard Nathanson, was an abortionist in New York State. These men began spreading lies that tens of thousands of women were dying a year from late-term abortions, which later Bernard Nathanson, when he became pro-life, uh, admitted was a lie. Christopher Teets. Planned Parenthood's own award-winning statistician estimated that in the late 1960s that fewer than 1,000 women a year were dying from illegal abortions. That he said there's no way the statistics that the abortion lobby used to ram abortion down our throats to gain public sympathy for why we needed a legal, legal abortion throughout the country was epically wrong. And in 1974, when the CDC actually tracked abortions, more women in 1974, the year after Roe, died from legal abortions than they died from illegal abortions. And that's facts on the CDC website. Because why would they go through the process of getting an illegal abortion when they're legal? And when more women died from legal abortions than illegal abortions. So my point is... Well, you didn't answer. Why would they go through the process of getting an illegal abortion? That was, that was 1974, abortion? actually. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Why would they go through the process of getting an illegal abortion when they are illegal? I don't know. Probably maybe because they don't have the money. Well, that's why the stat went down. That's the statistic went down for illegal abortions because more people were getting... Yeah, because when Roe was handed down, then, then the illegal black market for abortions suddenly kind of disappeared. The guys that were committing black back alley illegal abortions became abortionists. They just were able to advertise it. But my point is that even after Roe versus Wade was handed down, women were dying from, they were actually dying more of legal abortions than they did of illegal abortions. Because less people were performing illegal abortions. But I don't think, be, but, but the point is, women may die from seeking a procedure that is dangerous. But just because that is true, doesn't mean it should be legal. Because we don't legalize a lot of things in our country just because the people who choose to do them may face a severe consequence. Bank robbery, for example, is the most lethal like, um, crime you can commit. The death rate for bank robbers is like really high. Like, Do not try to mess with people's money. You will get shot and you will get killed. There's no national movement in our country that says, well, these bank robbers, they're poor. They just need money. I'm thinking about that movie with Ben Affleck right now. Um, they need money, they've got a mission, they're only, this is only their last bank robbery, their last one, and then they're out, then they're gonna go get a houseboat in Florida. 
We just need to legalize bank robbery in order to make bank robbery safer for bank robbers. No way we say that in our country. We say, hell no, they're trying to steal our money. It's wrong. We don't want bank robbers to die. We don't want anyone to die. But when you undertake a certain decision, you have to understand there's consequences to that decision. That's why we in the pro-life movement say we want abortion to be unavailable and unthinkable because we don't want any woman to die from a legal or illegal abortion. We don't want any woman to ever feel like she's so desperate to end the life of a human being that she has to go to some butcher to end the life of her baby in order to succeed. I would say that is a societal failure that's driven her to the hands of a man who profits off of her despair. And that's wrong. That's why we have a twofold mission in the pro-life movement. I think you have to understand that times have changed. It's not the 1960s anymore. In 2023, there are people that want to not have children. And that's understandable. That's actually in Elon Musk and many others who aren't pro-life would agree that's the greatest threat facing our civilization, that we have a, a generation of Zen, Gen Zs, over half, who are now actually trying to say that they're just purposely choosing not to have children. You can't you sustain why? our civilization that way. You guys worry about Social Security? That's not even going to be a thing because there's not going to be enough people to pay into Social Security to pay for your Social Security. Do you have to wonder why? These yeah, I do don't wonder why. Kids. I absolutely Nobody wants to wonder bring why. Their because it's selfish. No one wants to bring a new life into a world where they can't provide for themselves. So you think half a Gen Z, the most educated generation, the generation that's grown up in a time with the most wealthiest families in our country, you think the reason that half a Gen Z doesn't want to have kids is because they feel like they can't feed their kids? Because of the climate change. People don't want to bring that. Okay. People don't want to bring their children into a world that they think is going to end. We're already in the red for climate change, right? So why would you want to subject a new generation of children? Who into... are you saving the climate for? Who are we trying to save the climate are for? Are you trying to save the climate? Absolutely trying to save the climate. Really? Yes. Doing I recycle. What? You recycle? Yeah. Where does that recycling One go? One day I'm going to get a Tesla. Okay. Where does, that, where does recycling go? Land masses. It just goes mm -hmm. to landfills. Yeah, I mean, that's why most conservatives think they laugh when they hear people say recycling. But yeah. But I don't I understand your point, because if you're worried about climate change, I think everybody should be worried about climate change, although I don't, I'm not terrified of it because the world has undergone like six big climate changes since we, that we actually know and of. And you can go were extinction events. Well, the world has undergone climate changes, and we understand that. That's something that's natural, and we have to adapt to it, and we, we don't want climate change. But we're speeding no it up to the point where change, we can't control But I, the point of trying to stop climate change is to preserve our world for who? Our children who want to have kids. But if you don't have any kids, dude, how do we have a world? We don't have a civilization. I mean, Elon Musk, who's not a pro-life guy, who's one of the smartest people we all know, is one of the smartest people out there today, says this is the greatest threat to our common humanity, is the fact that we are below replacement value. Replacement value is 2.1 children per every woman. America, we've been holding steady. Since COVID, we're down to 1.9, 1.8. We're at European levels of replacement value. The African-American replacement value is like 1.5. Demographers are saying African-Americans as they exist today will not exist in decades. It's an absolute crisis that we're not replacing ourselves. If we care about saving our climate and our world, we do it because we care about our kids. So you've got to have kids to live in the world, right? Well, why would you want to bring kids into the world when they think it's going to end? Do you think, are you like a fundamentalist? Do you think the world's going to end? I mean, at some point, sure. So what, why would you, I, I'm sorry. Many Christians believe that the rapture will happen and God is going to end the world. And many Christians believe with all the signs that are happening right now, it's any day now. Catholics have a different view on it, but I used to be Protestant, so I, I have a foot in both camps. But that I've never heard a Christian, a fundamentalist Christian, a Catholic Christian, say, well, the world may end, Jesus may be coming back, therefore we're just not going to have any more kids. Because like, that's, well, that's like one of the things we're called to do, right? Is to as procreate. A as a Christian person, you believe that there is an afterlife. 
-hmm. Therefore, your children would go to that afterlife. Well, right? why would you care if you're not a Christian? Like the well, you just brought up being Christian. Yeah, I did. But like, so if you're not Christian, so yes, I think my children, when the world ends, however the world's going to end, whether it's the rapture or red zone climate change, hopefully, if I've done my job, my children go to heaven. If you're an atheist and you disagree with me, you think there's no creator, whatever, why would you care? Like, because, because people have morals. But it's between not being born at all and being killed. Like, so it's just better just not to be born ever. No one should ever be born because they may die. Because all of us are going to die. Whether we're like Christian or not, all of us know our time on this earth is extremely limited, right? So like, if, if can you imagine every parent in America today going, well, my kid's going to die, so therefore I'm not going to have any kids because it's better that they're never born. Like, you wouldn't have been born. There would be no civilization because all of us are going to die. Whether you think it's climate change, a uh, fundamentalist Christian thinks it's a rapture, or I just think they're going to live into a ripe old age, every child's going to die. So I don't think that makes sense to say because you're going to die, therefore no one should ever be born. So, like, there would be none of us. But I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm curious, like, what are you saving the world for? The next generation, if there is one. But how are you going to have a next generation if half of Gen Zs don't want to have kids? The people who want to have kids will have kids. Mm. And the people who but do you agree that's a problem, that we're below replacement value? People that want to value? have an abortion aren't doing it because they want to kill kids. Some of them want families in the future. They just can't handle it right now. Yeah, that's right. That's why we have to make abortion unthinkable. That's why I talked about standing well, then, with you and all the nonviolent support services that are available in communities to surround women and families in crisis. So you want a woman to give up her crisis. life to raise her kid? I'm sorry, what? You want a woman to give up her life to raise her kid? No, no one's asking a woman to give up her life to raise her kid. A woman can choose to parent her child. She can choose to place her child with an adoptive family. What if she wants to put herself first? What if she wants to abort that kid so she can have more chances to do I would say that's selfishness, sir. Because if she's engaged in an action, that she know she understands well, considering can that the United States of America is considered a free country, people would have the right to do what yeah, they Yeah, people want. can be selfish, but I can yeah. call them selfish. Sure. That's but that selfishness. doesn't mean that you can change legislation in order to make people not selfish. Yeah, I did we did. We've done it actually before. Think about ending slavery. You keep bringing up slavery. Yeah, because I'm in the South. I love history. I okay. get super excited when I come to Richmond because the Virginia is filled with history. And I'm reminded every single time I step into this state the horrors of slavery and what happened to this city ending the horrors of slavery we said no it doesn't matter if you're a slave owner and you have a big ass plantation you inherited from your daddy you cannot you cannot put your pursuit of happiness your profit over another human being's liberty and we don't care if that hurts your your bottom line you have to start paying your workers. You can't enslave other human beings. We said that's a moral wrong. Your selfishness doesn't get to dictate whether or not other human beings are free to live their lives. Okay. But we the did that. There would be that slaves and slavery were full people. Mine's uh, kind of quick. Um, I thought you were really articulate, and thank you for opening up this forum to everybody. Um, appreciate the constitutional right of dissent for all, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of belief. Um, I think I also remember you from the prison rally. Um, I don't believe in the death penalty. I think that's a phenomenal mention that you made and really appreciate that. Um, I was confused about Title IX. Mm. Um, what does that what does that mean that attention attention the time is now 9 30 p.m the university student comments will be closing soon please gather your belongings and head to the nearest exit thank you and have a good evening what what does that mean that will be destroyed title nine title nine is a, it's federally mandated protections right for women women in sports pregnant women in schools and so there's certain protections that have to be in place. So universities, public universities, for example, have to make reasonable accommodations because a woman being pregnant, now Obamacare, with, when they passed ACA, uh, HHS labeled uh, pregnancy a preventable disease, mm -hmm. um, which is fundamentally wrong and very anti-feminist. But um, you can't discriminate and you can't say because a, a woman 
is on our campus, she's pregnant, that she doesn't have the same rights and access to classrooms and education and her dorm rooms. And so there's certain protection. I mean, there's, there's obviously the Pregnancy Non-Discrimination Act. There's a bunch of different pregnancy acts and uh, pregnancy-related acts or parenting acts that are out there for women uh, and men uh, in the workplace and in academia, but Title IX specifically protects women um, and ensures. So for example, we had a situation not long ago in Colorado with a public university uh, where a girl was giving birth during finals and the professor gave her an incomplete and said there's no makeup, it's finals. And because of that, the school then, and this is a public uh, community college, Pikes Peak Community College, literally said, well, you've lost, because you had this incomplete, you didn't, your grades or whatever, you've lost federal your federal scholarships. So then we had to write a letter and like, she was giving birth, that's an excused absence. Um, you can't punish her. And so it was, it was actually really sad because she dropped out of school, got a job, then we found out about, then we had to write the letter to the school reminding the school what Title IX protections was, that they were clearly discriminating against the pregnant student member. Then they were like, oh yeah, that's right. And then it's restored and then she had to go back to what actually put her like a whole semester behind. So you all actually advocate for women as Students for Life of America. Yes. Advocate for their rights. Yes, because most of us are women. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, BCU, for hosting me. I think we're going to take a quick uh, group picture. Okay, great. Okay.